up everyone we're back with more great ace attorney and now we're gonna head over to the Garadubs yet again hello is anybody home 19th of February mr. Garadubs room no specific time Moshi mosh oh you pair again tell me was the detective chap I forget his name still hard at work down there Mr. Herlock Sholmes? Ah yes, rings a vague bell. All that detective business isn't really my thing, I'm afraid. Dude just devoured that- that- that tea. Just all in one swift motion, it's gone. Well, Mr. Sholmes is in his element down there. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to put it. Jolly good show. Another cup of tea, if you please, Joanne. Uh-oh. You shouldn't have asked for that. Now then, why don't you tell me what... For the umpteenth, umpteenth time, woman, will you watch what you're bally well doing? I shall be serving dinner shortly, sir. Hmm? Uh, yes, of course. Frightfully rude of me, but I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to take your leave if you'd be so kind. Oh, yes, of course. We are deeply grateful for all your assistance. Not at all, not at all. Don't get much chance to talk with young foreigners like yourselves. It's been a pleasure. Best of luck and all that. Perhaps you could see yourselves out. Uh, according to Mr. Sholmes, Mr. Garadub is hiding something. And since no other avenues of investigation seem open to us at the moment, perhaps we should do some digging. But where? Uh... You mean examining? Wait, what? Some in here. Are... Are those mortar shells? They're enormous! I hadn't noticed! What are they doing here? Oh, those old things. Couple of little rounds I accidentally fired into the barracks during training, you know. Because a, a bit of colorful regiment became a bit of colorful regiment folklore that incident. Y you mean you deliberately hunted out the spent shells? Well, I wouldn't say deliberately exactly. They're only scrap iron after all, usually just thrown away, I believe. But you never know when things might come in useful, do you? Useful for what exactly? Hmm, yes, well... Joanne here did manage to knock one of the bally things on my foot the other day while she was dusting. Ow! That must hurt like none other, especially considering you need a cane to walk. Well, assuming you can even feel it. Hadn't shed a tear since 1869 before then, you know. Okay, never mind, he did indeed feel it, very much so. Maybe reconsider throwing them away? Okay, well that was funny dialogue, but nope, that is not what we're looking for, it would seem. What's this? I just realized there's like a candle on the ground. I didn't notice that the first time. Uh. God damn it, man. <laughs> you know, that's real freaking clever. They freaking hit it behind the button here. Like, it's- the camera moves perfectly to conceal Sholm's presence. Like, unless you scroll it over here to reveal him, it, like, perfectly covers him up. That's a, that's pretty ingenious, honestly. My god. Uh, but... Huh? This old candle holder looks a little out of place here, wouldn't you say? Yes, you're right. It's clearly supposed to be gold, but it's almost completely black for some reason. Um, that old thing, yes. Just a piece of... I Ironmongery. Gimcrack, really. Never heard that term before. Oh. Used it when I was studying, don't you know, for my commission. I know it's old, hardly worth hanging on to, really, but, well, still has its uses sometimes. Oh wait, I just realized. It's missing one of its three candles and there's a candle on the ground. Of course. 
Does everything in this room have some elaborate story behind it? They're memories, Mr. Narahodo. Memories. I will never be just a memory. Ah, uh, what's he doing over there? Bro, I ask that every single time this man shows up. <laughs> I never get tired of it, though. But I always question it. Uh, Mr. Sholmes? Aha! We meet again, my dear fellows. Uh, yes, we just talked to you, like, five minutes ago in the story. Good gracious, when did you sneak in here? Herlock Sholmes, sir, at your service. Whatever were you doing over by the window? I am given to watching the evening sky as the sun sets, madam. Yet sadly, cheerful as the room downstairs undoubtedly is, it lacks an aperture for, sub for such observation. So I took the liberty of borrowing a small corner of space by the window up here. <laughs> oh, well. Keeping an eye to one's windows at dusk is the prudent thing to do in London, I'm gathering. I mean, if you wanted to look out at the sky outside, couldn't you have just, you know, looked from outside since you had to go outside in order to get to this room? Just a thought. Ah, and one other thing, Mr. Narahodo. Oh, me? I thought perhaps you might be in need of a certain great detective's great mind. Wait, he's not talking about... Is he... I didn't expect to be going through that again so soon. Do you mean Mr. Sholmes? There is a mighty secret in this modest room. My eyes see even the most trivial of trifles. I take it you're prepared, Mr. Narahodo. Uh, I think so. There is just a time enough for one of my greatly admired great deductions. Let us conclude the matter before dark. Okay, I guess we're going straight into it. I was not expecting to do one of these. Mr. Garadim. Though it would seem you are a military man of considerably distinguished service. Your standing as a landlord is most certainly not what one might call first rate. Hmm? I'm afraid, sir that it is all too clear to me. There are two conclusions I have been able to draw by careful observation of your living arrangements. Why is it always two with you? I beg your pardon. The first is that even as we speak, you are concealing the presence of a ferocious beast in your care. Huh? And the second is that as a result of the beast's violent rampage, you have lost something very dear to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Narahodo, look! The old, the old man's broken out in a cold sweat. Unbelievably, it seems Mr. Sholmes' conclusions are both spot on. How? How could you possibly... How could I possibly know you mean to inquire? The answer couldn't be simpler, sir. For in the dense jungle of logic and reasoning, I am the king of beasts. Oh. They, sh they are shooketh, and I know only too well that beasts are not easily tamed. So, shall we begin? Once again, Herlock Sholmes is proud to present Logic and Reasoning Spectacular. The curtain shall now rise. The game is afoot. Topic 1. Nature of the Beast. Uh, let me guess, what's it gonna be, a lion? Because there's a lion statue up there? It certainly shouldn't take a great detective to see. That a fearsome beast has been on the rampage of late within these four walls. Thus we are faced with the question. What form might the beast take? Ah, uh, for a man with military breeding, your eyes are uncommonly candid. 
Your furtive glance, Mr. Geridub, lead us directly to the answer. Oh my. Hey, I called it. The true nature of the beast that has run rampant here is revealed by that lion statue. Yes, though an army man, you appear unimposing at best. Wow. Trashing on this man. A fact that has fueled your admiration for the mighty lion, the king of beasts. What is this piffle, I ask you? In the end, your admiration became so great, in fact, that you had a living, breathing specimen shipped from India, which you tried to keep in this very house. What? Oh, he just fell down. You okay there, man? I thought I saw something for a second there. Yet yeah, living with such a wild beast proved more difficult than you had imagined. The chilling traces of a wild rampage are still very much in evidence. <laughs> Yet as we look around, the beast in question fails to present itself. Where could this angry creature have disappeared to? Madam. I pray you do not consider me unchivalrous, but it is plain to me with one glance in your direction. It... it is. Your dress pocket gives us a handsome clue as to the beast code's whereabouts. For protruding from it is a handbill advertising a circus show. Oh. Oh. Yes, you sought to dispose of this terrifying lion, Mr. Garridan, and it is hiding right behind that partition. At Baddy's Circus, a traveling show currently sojourning in a nearby park. I have observed the tents. You sold the Savage Lion, sir, to the circus troupe. I, I most certainly did not. I believe I have made my point. You are not a clown. You are the entire circus. The fearsome beast which run amok in this room was an Indian lion. And a simple visit to the circus now will reveal the lion prancing jubil jubilantly through a ring of fire. I can't wait to go see Omaru Polka. Topic 2. The Aftermath. Now, Mr. Gerinib. It is plainly clear that you still have deep feelings for this formidable beast. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, why else would he have that statue? Indeed, in that blithe pose, the distress... The dis... The distress this loss has caused you is veritably tangible. Your head weighs heavily on your shoulders, the pain you're feeling being revealed by that supporting arm. Amid fits of tears, you let your beloved beast go. <coughs> uh, sorry, I lost a life, but I am a gamer, so I have more. The strain of losing something so dear to you is clearly visible in your visage. Nonsense, man, I, I simply... But what we must now ask ourselves is the true cause of this pain. And we need only follow the direction of your gaze to find the answer. Yes, it is this pile of bills that has given rise to the paid use suffer. Yeah. Every envelope contains another demand for payment. Oh. For cartloads of meat, potatoes, wheat, and tea. Indeed, feeding your beloved has had a devastating impact on the financial circumstances of your household. And so you had no choice but to let it go. Yes, Willem. Now, in a final fit of rage, the ferocious beast carried out one last unimaginable attack. Unimaginable? 
The aftermath of which can be clearly seen by observing the carpet over there. Very expensive woolen carpet, if I am not mistaken. Oh, dear me. What could have caused such a destructive outburst? Oh. This time, madam, I'm afraid it is you who has inadvertently revealed the truth to me. Your wandering eye has saddled upon the answer very neatly indeed. Yes, to explain the dire state of the carpet, we need only look at the Tower of Cakes. Clearly, the lion had had a craving for some sweets. There is no creature more dangerous on this earth than a beast with an unsatiated appetite. Was it or was it not once said by a certain noblewoman? If they have no bread, let them eat cake. Food is at the heart of all tragedy, in fact. Whatever do you mean? Having tired of the taste of cake, the beast began to stalk its next prey. I'm sure I need not spill out the nature of this final act of destruction carried out by the beast. There was only one logical conclusion. Worked into a frenzy by hunger, the lion intact and ate the carpet. The teeth marks in the carpet are a perfect match with those of a lion I once saw in India. Bro, you are on some type of drugs for this. Carpet not on by the starving lion. Somehow I doubt it. Thus concludes Herlock Shum's great deduction of this beastly puzzle. Sasuya Shom's son. Oh my god, look at his look at his freaking Urgh! His mouth his mouth was wide open. What is the matter with you, Joanne? Joanne. Your poor your poem scolding hot tea all over me. For some reason I, I sounded like that blasted detective for a second there. That was quite weird. No, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Garidup. I'm afraid I didn't notice. My deductions can be startlingly sharp. It stands to reason that your cup runneth over. Indeed, my revelations can make people spill, te spill tears at times, too. Yeah, probably like freaking Natsume, who's probably crying in jail right now. Ooh! Um, uh, Mr. Sholmes, sorry to butt in again, but could I make an observation? Why suddenly, Mr. Naruhodo? What is it? Again. Well, your deduction just now... Do you really think a lion can fit inside a room of this size? Indeed. It is the only explanation for the facts. The terrifying truth all too often lies beyond the realms of common sense. But wouldn't it be an idea to consider what lies inside the realms of common sense as well? But if an uncaged lion had run amok in this very room... Surely Mr. Garridum and his maid would have been hurt, or worse. Ah, that's where you are stuck. No doubt the former military man held his own against the beast using that large cannon. I thought you said that they sold the lion to the circus. What about the food? Meat and potatoes are one thing. But I don't believe I have ever heard of a, of a lion that drinks tea. Ah, my dear Miss Susato, it occurs to me with some regularity that, that irrespective of, of race and breeding, whenever anyone lands on Great British soil, they are infused with a highly appropriate taste for afternoon tea. Ah, oh, this man. I love this man a lot, but goddamn is he an idiot. What a glorious notion! Sorry, I was drinking some water instead of tea. Well then, Mr. Narhodo, it's your turn to shine again. I had a feeling that was coming. A slight massage? That's all Mr. Mr. Sholm's deductions need. You can do it. Excellent. I've been waiting for my trusty partner in deduction to step forward, Mr. Narhodo. I don't even know yet whether or not this is going to help with the, Mr. Natsume's case. Still... 
Uncovering the truth is always worthwhile, whatever the motivation. Now I'm a little motivated. At least that's what I want to believe. Let us start again. From the beginning. Herlock Sholmes logic and reasoning spectacular. Yay! Part two. Chotamate. All right. Bum, 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 skipping through the dialogue so we can get to all of the stuff that we need right now. I just want to continue and get to the new dialogue right now. I really didn't see the lion thing coming. No, but if you observe Mr. Garadip's reaction, it rather seems as though some beast did indeed run amok here in this room. Clearly it was the cannon. It gained sentience. Yeah, something with a very fierce nature. But it couldn't have been a lion transport But it couldn't have been a lion transported from India. So what was it then? We must follow Mr. Garadib's gaze. That will lead us to the true answer, so let me save, because I'm gonna go for all the meme answers, as always. Be gone, speckled bands. We are two episodes later. Or two cases later. Uh, looks like whatever's in the back there is probably what it is, so what else we got? Mortar shells. Hell yes. Well, this is the lion statue that Mr. Sholmes picked out. Yes, I wonder. Perhaps if you did li live with a lion, it would prove to be a rather sweet companion. I mean, hey, the mane would certainly make us a good pillow, probably. I think that's like a mouse trying to tell its family that the cat around the house is sweet. I suppose it is a bit of a flight of fancy, isn't it? Anyway, the beast we're looking for is something else. Let's have a good look around. Except not really, because I'm going to present this. Take that! Take that! Bop. There is no beast more ferocious than the lion. And no lion that wouldn't unleash its ferocity in unfamiliar surroundings such as this. So, it must have been a lion. No other proof is necessary. Tashkani. Da da ba ba ba, I got it wrong yet again. Skipping through all of this dialogue to get to something different. Mortar shells, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, just... Mortar shells. Examine. Th these are shells for the cannon, are, are they? What a strange place to keep them. I imagine they must have significance to Mr. Garadab from his time at the army. Yeah. Ah, of course, he mentioned in battle to us before, didn't he? Do you remember? He said that he'd been shot in the knee. Perhaps it was one of these that hit him. Uh, I feel like if that- if one of these shot him in the knee, he wouldn't have a leg. If around that size it hit his knee, there'd be nothing left of it. Or Mr. Garadim, for that matter. This is also true. Mr. Sholmes has a Persian slipper. And this man has spent shells. Perhaps it's customary in Britain to display, well, rubbish on the mantelpiece. Don't listen, don't worry about it. We're presenting it. Who cares? The true identity of the beast that tore this room apart is these shells. With their butter... With their butter wouldn't melt accomplice, the cannon. But war is good for nothing. War, what is it good for? Or absolutely nothing. It brings only destruction. Something we must all strive to understand. I think it, I don't know if there's anything else besides the actual answer. So, is there anything this way, perhaps? The window to the wall. Okay, nope. And now I load. Already. And this. Photograph frame. What's this photograph? It appears to be for Mr. Garadab's wedding. He looks very happy, doesn't he? He does, but you can't make out his bride. No, how unfortunate. Something must have struck the glass directly over the woman's face. 
I wonder what happened. It's probably best not to delve too deeply there. I mean, hey, at least it's just the frame that's broken. It looks like the, the picture underneath is still safe. That's good. Oh, I can examine them individually. Huh. This must have been when Mr. Garrett was still in the army. Seems to be carrying his rather stout bride effortlessly and beaming a smile at the same time. I suppose he was very strong in his younger years. Hard to imagine now, he's as thin as a rake. It's you! By that Mr. Garrida. As we can see from this photographic print, some ten years ago you were a fighting fit soldier, Mr. Garrida. No doubt a man of such strength doesn't devastate a room like this in a fit of rage. But that was ten years ago, sir. Do you not think it's time you tidied the place up? Why are you such a dumbass? And this is coming from me of all people. Now, since I loaded, what happens if I just present the frame itself? Take that! Behind the lion statue on the mantelpiece, almost deliberately hidden from view, is a photograph. Though I have yet to examine it in detail, I can assure you that it holds the answer. Because I'm employing an extremely advanced detection technique called jumping to conclusions, you see. Okay. Loading. <laughs> Newlywed bride. The glass is broken so you can't see the bride's face at all. No amount of cracks could hide the woman's plump form. Wow. Just calling the... Just calling the lady out. Quite the judgmental person, aren't you, Ryunosuke? I think powerful would be kinder than plump, Mr. Naruhoto. I, I agree. You're being kind of rude. Yes, she certainly looks that. There's a lot of horsepower there. Not someone you'd want to upset, that's for sure. Oh, look, have you noticed her wedding ring? It's very large, isn't it? Yes, it's an unusual design. Looks like some sort of embellished sunflower. Huh. Anyways, I believe this is easily the answer. The true nature of the beast that has run rampant here is revealed by the newlywed pick bride. Precisely, Mr. Narahodo. No other explanation could possibly fit. Yes, this framed print pictures your wife, Mr. Garridub. And while we lament the fact that her face is obscured, we can still make out her mighty arms and note the considerable horsepower they must contain. I like how Ryanosuke just like... Like when the lights go out, he just like flinches backwards and is like, Oh god. Oh, um... Indeed, surely any woman of such powerful constitution would be honored to be described as a beast. Um, honored might be stretching a point. Too late. The fact remains that the beast, which so clearly savaged this room, was your wife, Mr. Garridan. I think it's pretty obvious already, so I'm gonna just say I bet you the next thing we do is we look underneath the tray and see the wedding ring. Oh, look! Did you see his face? There was some red on it. He had red on the other side of his face. The chilling traces of a of a wild rampage are still very much in evidence. Well. Yet as we look around, the beast in question fails to present itself. We've already seen this. Okay, here we are. The poor, fragile, defenseless woman is beside herself. Well, I don't know about fragile. Oh dear. Anyway, Mr. Sholmes is quite right. There's no sign of, of Mr. Garrett of anywhere. Oh, Miss Garrida, maybe. Was that it? Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Garrida. But it seems there may be a, a clue as to her whereabouts. A clue that this maid is trying to hide. I wonder where Mr. Garrida's wife could be. We shall find out right now, because it's not the end of the episode. 
Curse, I gotta save and drink some water. All this voice acting does numbers on my throat, that's for sure. Let me guess. I look under and what do I see? But a wedding rain! Big shocker! I already, already guessed that, though. Uh. That certainly does appear to be a circus handbill poking out from her pocket. Batty Circus, currently performing shows in a park not far from here. What is it, McGilded Park? You don't think... Oh, God. Surely Mc Mr. Garrett didn't sell his wife to the circus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Mr. Narhodo, how could you even think such a thing? Uh, I was only joking. Besides, I would have gone with do you think he fed her to his pet lion? That's somehow worse. Oh, brother. Let's do it. Let's get the funnies. The circus flyer poking out from your pocket is compelling evidence that you have a connection to the beast we seek. Evidence that cannot be ignored even if I want to. And now I do the other stuff and skip the dialogue right now. Skip it all, skip it all, skip it, skip it, skip it all. Oh, can I look? Oh, I can. Oh, I can look. You can go 360 on this, like... Uh... Wow! Yeah, that is... Damn. My man got slapped. Hard. Like, damn, man. You okay? Anyways, uh... I don't know, the teapot? His freaking pipe? Present the maid herself? Too tightly shut eyes to avoid even the chance of a giveaway glance. Pursed the lips to prevent any secrets from slipping out. Rounded cheeks to deflect any abuse that might be hurled her way. Yes, this is an unnervingly powerful woman, Mr. Sato. It's your turn of phrase that's unnerving, Mr. Naruhoto. Obviously it's her. I mean, what else could it be? I'm not even sure if I should voice this. It's impossible to believe it could be true, yet for some reason the thought came into my mind. That this serving maid is in fact a mighty goddess of destruction. Yeah, I can see it. Blah, blah. I gotta remember that all of the freaking stuff that Sholmes puts out here is generic or stuff we've already heard of. Okay, fine. Then obviously the correct answer is the teapot. I mean, what else could it be? What a charming little teapot. And it's in pr pr pristine condition. I'm surprised it's not run out, actually, considering how many times she spilled it on that poor man. Joanne has been pouring some deliciously fragrant tea from it for Mr. Garridub, hasn't she? Well, not so much for Mr. Garridub. As on Mr. Garridub, wouldn't you say? I wouldn't dream of drawing attention to it. The teapot is the true answer. Bada boom. Years ago, I read about a pot like this in his book. It was an old Arabian tale. Inside the pot was a genie who once unleashed... Who once unleashed wielded the power to destroy the whole world. You are a total fucking dumbass, sir. Alright. Now time for the real answer, unless... There's anything else around here. Oh, it doesn't look like it. She's wearing a very large rain look. Oh yes, a sunflower design with some rather nice embellishments. Is that a sunflower? It looks more like a... looks more like it could be a sun. Which would make sense considering that the guy here looks like a moon. And it's on the ring finger of her left hand, which means it's surely a wedding ring. It looks like it's on there for life, too. I can't imagine it would slide off a finger of that size. That's something to think, Mr. Naruho uh, Naruhodo, not to say. Sorry. Do you know Do you know Mr. Garridub's wife in the photograph had a 
had a rain very much like this one. It was a large sunflower design as well. Really? You have a great memory for these things, even though we just saw it, like, less than ten minutes ago. Mmm, a large sunflower wedding ring. It's quite a coincidence that they have the same ring, isn't it? And ba-boom. Correct. Your wedding ring gives us a handsome clue as to the beast's current whereabouts. Oh! Indeed it does. That flowery band gleaming on your finger gives you away. For what is identical to the one shown on the hand of Mr. Garridum's bride in this photographic print. In other words, you are no ordinary household maid. No. You are Mr. Garridum's lucky bride. You are Miss Garridum herself. Oh my god! Ooh, ooh, ooh. I can't do sophisticated lady voices like this. Well, jolly fine de de detecting, sir. As you rightly surmise, this is the wife, yes. My Joanne. Rather let herself go, you might say, but she has a bolly corker back. It would appear that you don't live in the most comfortable of circumstances. After all, you are a retired army man, yet you are in the business of renting out rooms. <laughs> I would assume, therefore, you have insufficient means to employ a maid, would that be correct? I just want to go back to this line. Rather let herself go, you might say, but she certainly has a bolly corker back. Was he about to say backside? Was he trying to say he, he, she has a nice ass? It's not right, I tell you. I was second lieutenant of the 3rd Regiment. A man has his pride, don't you know? By golly, it's a sorry thing when a chap can't even afford to have a single maid in his employ. Yes, here in London, one is rather judged. A household cannot be considered worthy of society if it employs no staff at all. Though in my considered opinion, such concerns about appearances are a folly. You, you mean Mr. Garridum has his wife work as his maid? Precisely. Am I right, Mr. Garridum? Only in company, obviously. But listen here, this must remain a secret. Tip top secret, please. Alright. The raging wife of Mr. Gar of Mr. Garridup. I love this song. I'm sorry if my singing is annoying right now. Mr. Sholmes is quite something. He's still calling Mr. Garrett's wife a beast. <laughs> he has no chill, trust me. Yes, it's a woman that feels rather uncomfortable. Yeah, but he's Mr. Sholmes, so you're not going to say anything to him. But Miss Garadeb is standing beside her husband as we speak. In other words, he hasn't lost his beloved at all, has he? Oh, how true! So perhaps that supporting arm that seems to be propping up his head has some other significance then. According to Mr. Sholmes, Mr. Garadeb's pain is tangible, though. What could that pose of his really signify? Well, I guess we should find out. Ah, uh, yes, the pipe, clearly. Oh, that's actually- oh, you can actually see his- You can see his, uh... Yeah, you can see it. You have a sun, and then you have a moon. I don't know what Susado's talking about a sunflower for, honestly. She kinda cracked. Slapped cheek. Well, I have three things to present here. Let's go with- Let's go with the supporting arm, since that's the funny thing. 
Mr. Garrett certainly looks glum. According to Mr. Sholm's deduction, that's because he's having to endure the acute pain of losing something dear to him. But we know that he hasn't lost his wife. So that means there must be another cause for the pain he's suffering. Well, that means we're still going pre to present it, though. Sometimes it's hard to read people's expressions. A man may have have his head in his hands for many reasons. Perhaps because he's in great pain, certainly. Or perhaps because he's lost in a wonderful memory of the past. I believe, Mr. Garadub, that you're in the throes of being lost in wonderful memories of great pain. Oopsies. Well, I, I didn't save, so I'm just probably going to take the, the L on that one. What is the cause of his acute pain that Mr. Garadub obviously feels? It's rather strange, you know. He always seems to look at us only out of the corner of his eye. Maybe something is stopping him from turning his head. Perhaps we need to continue, consider what that pain is from another angle. Oops, I forgot. I forgot to save. Ah, uh, okay, fine, the pipe. It's the pipe. That's a very large pipe, isn't it? Yes, anyone who has something that size hanging out of his mouth on a regular basis is sure to have a serious chin like Mr. Garadub's. Also, he's been using it to freaking stir his tea. That's kind of nasty, if I'm being honest. But what's that white binding around it all about? You know, that's a good point, actually. Take that! What, did it break? It seems to me that your large pipe, Mr. Garrett, must be very heavy. Having that thing around your mouth all day, but... Hanging out of your mouth all day would cause anyone's jaw to ache. You must give up smoking. It's the first step towards a f pain free life. Yo, everyone take notes of this line. It's very important for everyone in this world. And skipping the lines now that we actually only have the real one left. Slap cheek. Oh my, look at that bright red mark. Gosh, that's quite something, and clearly made by someone's hand. It's over his eye and eyebrow as well. That was a real, like, firm slap. Like, it made full contact. There wasn't a single bit that didn't make contact. Yes, Mr. Garadub has been slapped on the face, it seems. And hard. I've never seen such a clearly defined mark. I know, right? Look at that. You can see multiple marks on his frickin'... On his frickin'... Eyebrow. Whoever could have done such a thing? Well, there's a very limited number of candidates, I'd say. Bop! Slapped sheep. Smelved climps. Your head weighs heavy on your shoulders, the pain you feel being revealed by that slapped sheep. And of course, the deliverer of that impressive mark on your cheek that refuses to fade. Was you, Madame Joa Joanne Garrett. She has the frickin' she has the frickin' anime eyes now. Well yes. You have been desperate to hide the slap mark on your cheek, sir. Org. How the blazes? How did you work that out, man? Nothing escapes the notices of one trained in the art of observation, my dear fellow. Uh, Mr. Sholmes, that was me. Shush! I'm having my moment. That's why you haven't looked directly at us even once. To keep your other side hidden from view. Well, um... Hmm. Now, let us proceed to the next conundrum. Why were you subjected to such a violent slap? In other words, we must ask ourselves what caused Mr. G Madame Gerardim to fly into a rage. Well, the words have changed, but they're still looking the same way. No, sir. It is not that. I guarantee it. 
Didn't Mr. Sholm say that the bills were all for lion fodder? Yes, but now we've established that the lion never existed. Which can only mean that the, that the thing responsible for gobbling up all that food was Mr. Garadab's wife. Mr. Narhodo, she's a person, not a thing. Yes, well, people can still eat paper, you know. She's also a person who gave her husband a mighty slap around the face. One so hard that it left a perfect hand mark, in fact. Yes, why would a woman want to hit her husband with such force, I wonder? I don't know, was he cheating? I'd love to know the answer to that question. Though hell, considering considering the situation with Mr. Garadab's legs, who knows if he can even get it up. I mean, what? Uh, I didn't say nothing. Uh, oh, I already see the answer. Ah, oh, crap, I didn't do it again. God damn it. Stack of books. Fine. There are a lot of books stacked, stacked up on the shelf here. Look, all novels that I've never heard of. It would appear someone has purchased them all from a second-hand bookshop. Gee, I wonder which one. Also, uh, I'm pretty sure those are all the exact same book. I think Mr. Garrett was something of a book lover. Then clearly it's this. Stack of books. What causes the most pain to any man? The answer, of course, is purchasing an interesting looking book only to find it is written in Russian. He speaks from experience on this, trust me. For that reason, we should all learn Russian. Think of all the sorrow you could avoid. You are an utter fool. Yeah. Okay. You already know the cause of Mr. Gabe pain, slap across the cheek, blah blah blah. Wait, sorry. I skimmed over some stuff, but it actually seems to be some... Mr. Garadab and his wife seem to shame of share a very deep and loving bond. Perhaps, but it's said that the stronger people's feelings are, the more fiercely they react to betrayal. You seem to know a lot about the ways of the heart, Mr. Narhodo. I read it in a popular novel that I borrowed from Kazuma. So we're looking for a reason why Mr. Garadab would have betrayed by Hojbian. Let us save this time, because I have forgotten quite a bit. Okay. What about... What's this over here? Nothing? Okay. Look at all these bills! It certainly amounts to a great deal of food. Me meat and potatoes by the cartload, wasn't it? Well, looking at the two of them, you can tell immediately who eats the lion's share in this household. Well, at least we're no longer talking about an actual lion anymore. I'm surprised you didn't do use the Susado takedown on Ryanosuke for mentioning what he just said. Anyways. Take that. You know, I'm pretty sure my cursor wasn't even on the pile of bills, but we take those. What causes the most pain to any man? The answer, of course, is a pile of bills in an empty purse. In fact, just imagine it brings tears to my eyes. It makes his one figure look like two. Are you quite concentrating? No, really I'm not. Alright. Anything else? No. Well, there's... You can see broken glass over here. That's a first. Oh, this seems to be the right one. Ah, someone must be reading this book at the moment. There's a bookmark here. Look! Mr. Garadab is clearly an avid reader. Oh, wait a minute. I don't think this is a bookmark. Oh no, so it isn't. It's a note written in a woman's hand. Oh, James, I love you. Yours, Mary. And look at the signature here. Lip marks made with lipstick. Oh, what a passionate and romantic gesture. Don't get any ideas, susato on. Oh dear, I'm sorry. So this bookmark is actually a love note, then. Hmm. Well, I think it's safe to say. Oh, it actually changes it. What happens if I examine it a second time? So this card that looks like it's being used as a bookmark is actually a love note. See, Garadab's first name is Joanne, isn't it? Yes, I believe we may be heading into dangerous territory. We have reached the NTR arc. The NT arc, as you might call it. It's very conspicuous, after all, isn't it? 
You mean the bright red lips next to the woman's signature? Yes, it's the first thing you notice, of course, and it rather makes your heart skip a beat. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go back. Let's present it while it's still a bookmark. Take that! What causes the most pain to any man? The answer, of course, is dropping your bookmark and losing your place in the book you're reading. Oh, God. Man, I relate to that one a lot. I mean, I don't read much in an, an extensive amount nowadays, but who, oh, man, have I related to that in the past. Or worse, dropping someone else's bookmark and getting a slap for it. And back we go. All right, and now for the right answer. Checkmate. Yes, it is this love note that has given rise to the pain you suffer. Oh, James, I love you. Yours, Mary. Passionate indeed. Perhaps the sender of this note, a certain Miss Mary, is the fly in the ointment here. Ow! Frickin' spousal abuse. But I don't know the Bali woman. You don't know her. That note wasn't written to me. It was just in the book. I don't know how it got there. It was just in there, you say? That's right, that's what I've been saying! A likely story. Now listen here, Joe Ann, old thing. I explained it at the time. I bought the book at that second-hand place, and that note must already have been in there. So the previous owner of the book was using the note as a bookmark, you mean? That's right, that's what I've been saying! A likely story. For heaven's sake, woman, look at the name. It's written to James. My name, in case you'd forgotten, is John. A likely story. Are, are you questioning my name now? Good lord, this poor dude. And there we have it. Arouse the suspicions of the female heart, and you, unle and you unleash a beast with the most ferocious bite. Ugh. I feel bad for this guy. Now, in a final fit of rage, the ferocious beast carries out one last unimaginable attack. Unimaginable? What unimaginable attack? We'll find out next time on Great Ace Attorney when we wrap up this deduction. Adios, ciao, and bye-bye. Signing off until next time. Ja, matane!